Hello and welcome back to What the Health. I'm Julie Robner, Chief Washington Correspondent for KFF Health News, and I'm joined by some of the best and smartest health reporters in Washington. We're taping this week on Thursday, June 13th at 10.30 a.m. As always, news happens fast and things might have changed by the time you hear this. So here we go. We are joined today via video conference by Anna Edney of Bloomberg News. Hi there. Roshana Pradhan of KFF Health News. Hello. And Emery Hudeman, also of KFF Health News. Good morning. Later in this episode, we'll have my interview with KFF President and CEO Drew Altman, who I honestly can't believe hasn't been on the podcast before. He is here to talk about Health Policy 101, which is KFF's all-new, all-in-one introductory guide to health policy. But first, this week's news. So as we tape, we have breaking news from the Supreme Court about that case challenging the abortion pill mifepristone. And you know how we always say you can't predict what the court is going to do by listening to the oral arguments? Well, occasionally you can. And this was one of those times uh, the court watchers were correct. The justices ruled unanimously that the anti-abortion doctors who brought the suit against the pill lack standing to sue. So the suit has been dismissed, wrote Justice Kavanaugh, who wrote the unanimous opinion for the court, quote, a plaintiff's desire to make a drug less available for others does not establish standing to sue. So might anybody have standing? Have we not maybe heard the end of this case? Yeah, I think certainly there could be someone else who could decide to do that. I mean, just quickly looking around when this came out, it seems like maybe state AGs could take this up. So it doesn't seem like it's the last of it. I also quickly saw a statement from Senator Cassidy, a Republican, who mentioned this wasn't a ruling on the merits exactly of the case, but just that these doctors don't have standing. So it does seem like there would be efforts to bring it back. This is not going to be the last challenge to the abortion pill. Yeah. You know, just looking in my inbox this morning after the decision, I mean, it's clear that anti-abortion groups are really not done yet. So I think there's going to be a lot of pressure, of course, from from them. Um, It is an election year, so they're trying to get not wins as far as races go, but also to get various AGs to keep going on this. So Yeah, and if if you listen to last week's podcast, there are three AGs who are already part of this case. So they may take it back with the district court judge in Texas, we shall see. Anyway, more Supreme Court decisions to come. But moving on to campaign 2024, because, and this seems impossible, the first presidential debate is just two weeks away. President Biden is still struggling to convince the public that he's doing things that they support. Along those lines, this week, the administration proposed rules that would ban medical debt from being included in calculating people's credit scores. I thought that had happened already. What would this do that hasn't already been done? Well, last year, the big credit agencies volunteered to cut medical debt that's below $500 from people's credit reports. Of course, there's a lot of evidence that shows that that's not really the way that people get hurt with their credit scores. They get hurt when they have big medical bills. So this addresses a major concern that a lot of Americans have with paying for health care in the United States. I oversee our Bill of the Month project with NPR. And I can say that a lot of Americans will pay their medical bills without question, even for fear of harm to their credit score, even if they think that their bill might be wrong. Also, uh, it's worth noting also that researchers have found that medical debt does not accurately predict whether an individual is credit worthy, actually, which is unlike other kinds of debt that you'd find on credit scores. So, yeah, not paying your car payment suggests what you might or might not be able to do with a mortgage or a credit card, but not paying your surprise medical bill, maybe not so much. Yes, exactly. Really, like, you know, we can all end up in the emergency room with a big bill. You don't get a big bill just because you have trouble meeting your credit card bills or you have trouble meeting your car payments, for example. Well, we'll see if this one sort of resonates with the public because a lot of the things that the administration has done have not. Meanwhile, President Trump, who presided over one of the most rapid and successful vaccine development projects ever for the COVID vaccine, now seems to be moving more firmly into the anti-vax camp 
And it's not just apparently anti-COVID vaccine. Trump said at a rally last month that he would strip federal funding from schools with vaccine mandates, any vaccines apparently like measles and mumps and polio. And he says he would do it by executive order, no legislation required. This feels like it could have some pretty major consequences if he followed through on this. Anna, I see you nodding. You have you have yeah. a toddler. <laughs> right, right. I was just thinking about that, like, you know, going into kindergarten, what that could mean and there's just so many like I mean even kids don't have to get chicken pox nowadays that seems like a really great thing I don't know I mean I had chicken pox I think that it could kind of take us backwards obviously into a time that we're we're seeing pockets of as measles crops up in certain places and things like that I'd be curious what I don't know is like how much federal funding supports a lot of these schools I know there's state funding county funding like how much that's actually taking away if it would change the minds of certain ones but I guess if you're in a maybe a state that doesn't like vaccines in the first place like it's kind of a free for all to go ahead and do that. One of the questions I have, too, is through the CDC, we have the Vaccines for Children program, which provides free immunizations to children for a lot of these infectious diseases for children who are either uninsured or sort of underinsured or low income. And so that's been a really longstanding program. And I'm very curious as to whether they would try to maybe reduce or eliminate a bunch of the vaccines that are provided through that, which obviously could could affect a significant number of children nationwide. You know, it's, it's funny, the anti-vax movement has been around for, I don't know, 20, 25 years. When, whenever that Lancet piece that later got rescinded came out that connected vaccines to autism, it seems it's getting sort of... A, a boost. And yes, that's an <laughs> that's an uh, intended pun right now. Um, it's, I mean, are we just, I guess, COVID sort of and the doubts about COVID kind of is pushing on to these other vaccines too? I think that we've certainly seen that before COVID, at least my understanding of a lot of the concerns around the behavioral issues and autism linked to vaccines or things like that was more of the sort of left wing, maybe crunchier people who who were seeing it as not wanting to put, in their words, poison in their bodies. But now we're seeing sort of this this also right-wing opposition to it. And, and I think that's certainly linked to COVID. Any, you know, any kind of mandate at this point from the government is pushed back against more so than, than before. Well, we have lots of news this week on drugs and drug prices. Um, Anna, you have quite the story about how trying to save money by buying generic might not always be the best move. Um, as I described it, the, the, the scary story of the week. Tell us about it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I did this uh, data dive looking into store brand medication. So like when you go into CVS or Walgreens, for example, you can see the Tylenol brand name there, but next to it, you've got one that looks a lot like it, but it's got you know, CVS Health or Walgreens on the name, and it costs usually a few dollars less. What I found is that of those store brands, CVS has a lot more recalls uh, than the rest, even though they're selling like these same store brand drugs. So they have two to three times more recalls than Walgreens and Walmart. And what's happening is they are more often going to shady contract manufacturers to make their generic products that they're selling over the counter. I found, you know, one that was making kids medication with contaminated water. And then the really disturbing one that was nasal sprays for babies on the same machines that this company was using to make pesticides. And just wrote about a whole litany of these kinds of companies that CVS is hiring at a higher rate than the other two, Walgreens and Walmart, that I was able to do the data dive on. And interestingly, these store brands have sort of a loophole. So they're not responsible for the quality of those medications, even though their name's on it. They can just walk away and say, well, we put it on the shelves. We agree with that. But it's up to these companies that are making it to verify the quality. And so... That's usually not how this works, even if there's contract manufacturers, which a lot of drug makers use. They usually have to also verify the quality, but store brands are considered just distributors. And so there's this separation of who even owns the responsibility for this drug. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I think a collective <laughs> reaction reading this. I know. How many people did I text your story to, Anna, saying, yikes? (laughs) (laughs) Just (laughs) FYI. (laughs) So so on the one hand, you get what you pay for. On the other hand, 
Price is not the only problem that we find with drugs. A new study from the University of Utah Drug Information Service just found that pharmacists are reporting the largest number of drugs in shortage since the turn of the century. And my colleague Susan Jaffe has a story on how some shortages are being exacerbated at the pharmacy level by a new Medicare rule that was intended to lower prices for patients at the counter. Um, Anna, how close are we to the point where the drug distribution system is just going to collapse in on itself? It does not seem to be working very well. Yeah, it does feel that way because I always think of that example of the long balloon and when you squeeze it at one end, the other end gets bigger because when you're trying to help patients at the counter, somebody is taking that hit, like that money isn't just appearing out of thin air in their pockets. So the pharmacists are saying, you know, and particularly smaller pharmacies, but also some of the bigger ones are saying the way that these drugs are now being reimbursed, um, how that's working under this new effort is they they don't have as much cash on hand. So they're having trouble getting these big brand name drugs. Um, it was it was a really interesting story that Susan wrote. Just shows that you can't fix one end of it. You need to fix the whole thing somehow. I don't know how you do that. And shortages are another issue just of, of other kinds, whether it's quality issues or whether it's the demand is growing for a lot of these drugs and depending even on the time of year. So I think we're all seeing it just kind of appear to be disintegrating and hoping that there's just no like tragedy or big disaster where we really need to rely on it. Yeah, like, you know, another pandemic. Exactly. (laughs) There's also some good news on the drug front. An FDA advisory committee this week unanimously recommended approval for yet another potential Alzheimer's drug, donanumab. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I guess we'll learn more as we go on. The drug appears to have better evidence that it actually slows the progression of the disease without the risks of Aduhelm, the controversial drug approved by the FDA that's been discontinued by its manufacturer. This would be the second promising drug to be approved following Lakembi last year. When we first started talking about Aduhelm, what was that, two years ago, we Mm -hmm. talked about how it could break Medicare financially because so many people would be eligible for such an expensive drug. So now we're looking at maybe having two drugs like this, and I don't hear people talking about the potential costs anymore. Is there a reason why, or are we just worried about other things? Well, I think there's a benefit that they've seem to have proven more than Aduhelm, but there's also still a risk of brain swelling and bleeding. And that I'm sure would factor into someone's decision of whether they want to try this. So maybe people aren't exactly flocking in the same way to want to get these drugs. As they're used more, maybe that changes and we see more of, you know, can you spot these the swelling, can you stop it and things like that. But I think that there just seems to be a lot of questions around them also when they're, Aduhelm was the biggest one, which obviously Medicare didn't cover. And then, you know, they're not even trying to sell anymore. But I think that there's just always questions about how they're tested, how much benefit really there is as a few months worth that risk that you could have a major brain issue. While we are on the subject of drugs and drug prices, we have this week in misinformation uh, from former President Trump, who, as we all know, likes to take credit for things that are not his and deflect blame from things that are. Now, in a post on his Truth Social platform, he says that he is the one who lowered insulin copayments to $35 a month and that President Biden, quote, had nothing to do with it. Yes, the Trump administration did offer a voluntary $35 copayment program for Medicare Part D plans, but it was limited. It was time limited and not all the plans adopted it. President Biden actually didn't do the $35 copay either, but He did propose and sign the law that Congress passed that did it. It was part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, Ironically, President Biden didn't get all he wanted either. The intent was to limit insulin copayments for all patients. But so far, it's only for those on Medicare. I would guess that Trump is saying this to try to neutralize one of the few issues that maybe is getting through to the public about something that President Biden did. Well, I mean, I think even during President Trump's first term, I mean, lowering drug prices, He made it very clear that that was something that was important to him. He certainly wasn't following the traditional or older sort of Republican Party's friendliness to the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, he was openly antagonizing them a lot. And so it's certainly something that I think he understands resonates with people. And 
it's a pocketbook issue, similar to what's going on on medical debt that we talked about earlier, right? These new regulations that are being proposed, they may not be finalized. We'll have to see about that because of the timing. But these are things that are, I think, at the end of the day, of course, are very relatable to to people. Unlike perhaps abortion is a big campaign issue, but like it's not necessarily going to resonate with people in the same way. And certainly not potentially, you know, men and women in the same way. But I think that there's much more broad based understanding of having to pay a lot for medications and potentially not being able to afford it. Obviously, insulin is probably the best poster child for a lot of reasons for that, right? So no surprise he wants to take credit for it. And also perhaps that it's not really what happened. So (laughs) if nothing else, I think it signals that drug prices are still going to be a big issue in this campaign. For sure. And I mean, Joe Biden has made it very clear. I mean, the the Inflation Reduction Act, of course, included other measures to lower people's out-of-pocket costs for drugs, which he's very eagerly touting on the on the trail right now to sort of shore up support. Let's move on from drugs to abortion uh, via the FDA spending bill on Capitol Hill this week. The annual appropriations bills are starting to move in House committees, which is notable itself because this is when they are supposed to start moving if they're going to get done by October 1st, the start of the next fiscal year. We haven't seen that in a long time. So last year, Republicans got hung up because they wanted their leaders to attach all manner of policy riders to the spending bills, most of them aimed at abortion, which can't get through the Senate. Well, in a big shift, Republicans appear to be backing off of that. And the current version of the bill that funds the Department of Agriculture, as well as the FDA, does not include language trying to ban or further restrict the abortion pill mifepristone. Of course, that could still change. But my impression is that the new appropriations chairman, Tom Cole, who's very much a pragmatist, wants to get his bills, you know, signed into law. I do wonder, though, if because of the Supreme Court decision that just came out today, whether that will change the calculation or at the very least the pressure that he is under to include something in the FDA bill. But as you know, there's there's plenty of time for abortion riders to make it in or out. I feel like this is it's like Groundhog Day, like usually something related to abortion policy will upend the various pieces of legislation. So I, I'll be curious to be on the lookout for for that, whether it changes anything. Yeah. Anna, were you surprised that they left it out, at least at the at least at the start? Yeah, I I think you're know, just what we've seen with all of the rancor around abortion and abortion related issues, I guess a little surprise, but also maybe it makes sense. And just the sense that there are Republicans who are struggling with that issue and don't want to have to keep talking about it or voting on it in the same way. Well, that leads right to my next subject, which is that the Senate is voting this afternoon after we tape on a bill that would guarantee access to IVF. Republicans are expected to block it as they did last week on the bill to guarantee access to contraception. But as of Wednesday, it's going to be harder for Republicans to say they're voting against the bill because no one is threatening to block IVF. That's because the influential Southern Baptist Convention, one of the nation's largest evangelical groups, voted if not to ban IVF, at least to restrict the number of embryos that can be created and ban their destruction, which doctors say would make the treatments more expensive and less successful. It sounds like the rift among conservatives over contraception and IVF is a long way from getting settled here. That certainly seems to be true. It's also worth noting that there are a lot of influential members of Congress who are Baptist, of course, including House Speaker Mike Johnson. And um, I was refreshing my memory of the religious background of the current Congress with a Pew report. They say 67 members of this Congress are Baptist. Of course, Southern Baptist is the largest piece of that. And uh, 148 are Catholic, which, of course, is another denomination that opposes IVF as well. So that's a that's a pretty big constituency that has their churches t- telling them that they oppose IVF and should, too. Yeah. You know, everybody says they're not coming for contraception. They're not coming for IVF. I think we're going to see a very spirited and continued debate over both of those things. Well, speaking of the rift over reproductive health, former President Trump is struggling to please both sides and not really succeeding at it. He made a video address last week to the evangelical group, the Danbury Institute, which is a conservative subset of the aforementioned Southern Baptist Convention, in which... Former President Trump didn't use the word abortion and kind of skirted the issue. That prompted some grumbling from some of the attendees, reported Politico, even as Democrats called him an anti-abortion radical for even speaking to the group, which has labeled abortion, quote, child sacrifice. 
So far, Trump has gotten away with telling audiences what they want to hear, even if he contradicts himself regularly. But I feel like abortion is maybe the one issue where that's not going to work. Well, I think the the struggle really is even if people are sort of more forgiving of him saying different things, it puts a lot of down ballot candidates in a really difficult position. And I know, Julie, you, you'd wanted to talk about this, but, you know, Republican candidates for U.S. Senate, I mean, just how they have to thread the needle. And I, I don't know that voters will be as forgiving about changes in their position. So I think, you know, you know, they say it's like, it's not just about you. It's like when two people get married, they're like, it's not just about the two of you. It's like your whole family, right? Like this is like the family is your party and everyone down ballot who has to now <laughs> figure out what the best message is. And as we've seen, you know, they've really struggled with, we've shifted now from being many uh, candidates and Republican um, office holders supporting basically near total abortion bans, if not very early gestational limits to the 15 week ban being sort of a consensus position. And now saying, well, Trump saying he's not going to sign a national abortion ban, so let's leave it to the states. I mean, that's, it's just, it's, it keeps changing and I think obviously underscores the difficulty that they are all having with this. So I don't know how, I don't think it helps like for him to be saying inconsistent things all the time because then these other candidates for office really struggle, I think, with explaining their positions also. So as I say every week, I've been covering abortion for a very long time. And before Roe was overturned, the, the general political rule is you could change positions on abortion once. If you were anti-abortion, you could become pro-choice. And that's we've seen that among a lot of Democrats. Senator Casey in Pennsylvania is sort of a, a notable example. And if you supported abortion rights, you could become anti-abortion, which Trump kind of did when he was running the first time. Um, others have also as, you know, there are, and again, we're seeing this more among Republicans, but not exclusively. But people who try to change back usually get hammered. And as I say, Trump has sort of violated every political rule about everything. So not counting him, I'm wondering about, as you say, Rashan, is some of these Senate candidates, some of these down ballot candidates who are struggling to really sort of rationalize their current positions with maybe what they'd said before is something I think that bears watching over the next couple of months. Um, Absolutely. And we're seeing candidates who will change their tone within, you know, weeks of saying something or practically days at this point. They're really banking on our attention being pretty low as a public. <laughs> yeah. Although they, I, they may be right about that part. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, and there's a lot of time between now and November, but I think even the just all the things even this week, of course, between now and November is an eternity. But like we just talked about the Southern Baptist Convention sort of stance on IVF, of course, usually when these things happen, and it prompts a lot of questions to lawmakers about whether they support that kind of decision or, or not, or whether they agree with it. And I think these court decisions, the Supreme Court, of course, will be out, you know, by the end of June. And so right now, it might be fresh on people's minds. But it's hard to know whether September, October, whether that's sort of the dominant or very like prominent campaign issue in the same yeah. way. And at the same time, we have a long way to go and a short way to go. So we will actually all be watching. All right. Well, that is the news for this week. Now we will play my interview with Drew Altman and then we will come back and do our extra credits. I am pleased to welcome to the podcast Drew Altman, president and CEO of KFF, and of course, my boss. But lest you think that this is going to be a suck-up interview, you will see in a moment it's also a shameless self-promotion interview. Drew, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be on What the Hell. Thank you. So I asked you here to talk about KFF's new Health Policy 101 project, which launched last month as a resource to help teach the basics of health policy. I know this is something you've been thinking about for a while. Tell us what the idea was and who's the target audience here? Well, since the bronze era when I started KFF, faculty and students found their way to our stuff and they found it useful. It might have been a fact sheet about Medicaid or a policy brief about Medicare or a bunch of charts that we produced. But they've had to hunt and pack to find what they wanted, and someone would find something on Medicaid or Medicare or the ACA or healthcare costs or women's health policy or international comparisons or whatever it was. And for a very long time, I have wanted to organize our material about health policy for their world so that it was easy to find. It was one stop. 
and you could find all the basic materials that you wanted on the core stuff about health policy as a service to faculty and students interested in health policy because we don't just analyze it and poll about it and report on it. We have a deep commitment. We really care about health policy and health policy education. You said those are sort of the main topics covered. I assume that other topics could be added in the future. I mean, I could see a chapter on AI and healthcare. Yes, and we're starting with an introduction for me. There's a chapter by Larry Levitt about challenges ahead. There's a chapter by somebody named Julie Robner on Congress and the agencies who also wrote a book about all of that stuff, which is still available, folks. It desperately needs updating. So I'm pleased to be contributing to this. But this is just the first year. And there are 13 chapters on the issues that I ticked off a moment ago and many more issues. And we're starting the process of adding chapters. So the next chapter will probably be at LGBTQ issues. And then, though it's not exactly the same thing as health policy, by popular demand, we will have a chapter on the basics of public health and what is the public health system and spending on public health. And I will admit some of this also has origins in my own personal experience because before I was in government or in the nonprofit world or started and ran KFF, I was an academic at MIT, and I was fine when it came to big thoughts. And I even, you know, I, there I was, and I'd written a book about health cost regulation. But what I didn't know much about was how stuff really worked and the basics. And if I really needed to understand what was happening with regulation of private health insurance or the Medicaid program or the Medicare program, I didn't really have any place to go to get basic information about the history of the program or the details of the program or a few charts that would give me the facts that I needed or what are the current challenges. And when it really sunk in was when I left MIT and I went to work in what is now CMS and then was called ICFA. And boy, on the first day did I realize what I did not know. And it was only when I entered the real world of health policy that I understood how much I had to learn. So, you know, I wanted to bridge the two worlds a little bit by making available this kind of basic health policy 101. I confess I'm a little bit jealous that this hadn't existed when I started to learn health policy because, like you, I had to ferret it all out. Although, thankfully, KFF was yeah. there through most of it, and I was able to find most of it along the way. Exactly. And I, I think there'll be other audiences for this because if you're working on the Hill but you don't work full-time on health, if you're working in an association, if you're working anywhere in the healthcare system, there's lots of times when you really just need to understand, I just read about an 1115 waiver. What is that? Or what really is the difference between traditional Medicare and a Medicare Advantage plan? How is it that you get your drugs covered in the Medicare program? It seems to be lots of different ways. And just, you know, I'm confused. How does this actually work? I will admit to you also, I personally have an ulterior motive in all of this. And my ulterior motive is that it is my feeling now, and this has been kind of a slowly creeping problem, that there isn't enough what I would call health policy in health policy education. So that over time, it has become more about what is fashionable now, which is delivery and quality and value. And I won't name names, but I spent a couple of days advising a health policy center at a renowned medical school about their curriculum in what they called health policy. And the draft of it had nothing in it that I recognized as health policy. Some of this is understandable. It's because if your faculty with a disciplinary base, economics, political science, sociology, whatever, there's no reason you would know a lot about what we recognize as the core of health policy. There has been a serious decline in faith in government, in young people taking jobs in certainly the federal government, but a little bit in state government as well. So the jobs now are all in the healthcare industry, they're in tech, they're in consulting firms. And so I think there's just less of an incentive to learn a lot about Medicare, Medicaid, the ACA, the federal agencies, because you're not going to go work in the federal agencies, at least as frequently as students did in my time. And so just to be blunt about it, I'm in my mind trying to get more health policy back into health policy education. 
<laughs> well, as you know, I endorse that fully because that's what we're trying to do, too. Uh, one more question since I have you. I've been thinking about this a lot. When I started covering health policy, shortly after you left HICFA, the big issue was people without insurance. And then throughout sort of the early 2000s, the big issue was spiraling costs. I feel like now the big issue is people who simply cannot navigate the system. The system has become so Byzantine and complicated that, well, now there's a South Park about it. I mean, it's really, to get even minor things dealt with is a major undertaking. I mean, what do you see as sort of the biggest issue in policy for the next five or 10 years? Well, I think the big issue for healthcare people used to be access to care. Uh, now, only about 8% of the population is uninsured. The big issue now is affordability, in my mind, and the struggles Americans are having paying their health care bills. It is an especially acute problem, virtually a crisis, for people with severe illnesses or people who are chronically ill. 50, 60% of those people really struggle to pay their medical bills. The crisis or the problem that isn't discussed enough, because it isn't a single problem, it rears its head in so many ways is the one you're talking about. That is the complexity of the healthcare system. Just the sheer complexity of it, how difficult it is to navigate and to use for people who have insurance or don't have insurance. Uh, Larry Levitt and I wrote a piece in JAMA about this. And uh, we, all of us at KFF, are trying to focus more attention on that problem, need to do more work on that problem and the many parts of it. It's partly why we set up uh, an entire program a couple of years ago on consumer and patient protection, where we intend to focus more on just this issue of the complexity of the system. It makes it hard to make it work for people, but especially for patients who are people who encounter the system because they need it. Well, we will both continue to try to keep explaining it as it keeps getting more Byzantine. Drew Altman, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Julie, very much. Okay, we are back. Now it's time for our extra credit segment. That's when we each recommend a story we read this week we think you should read too. As always, don't worry if you miss it. We will post the links on the podcast page at kffhealthnews.org and in our show notes on your phone or other mobile device. Um, Emery, why don't you go first this week? Sure. My story comes from CBS. The headline is, as FDA urges crackdown on bird flu in raw milk, some states say their hands are tied. So the story says that there are three more states that have had their first reported cases of bird flu in the last month, and two of them don't really have a way to conduct increased oversight of dairy cows and the industry that seems to be particularly having problems here. Wyoming and Iowa are those two states. Basically, these are states where raw milk is unregulated, so there's no way for them to implement surveillance and restrictions on raw milk that might protect people from the fact that pasteurization appears to kill bird flu, but you don't have pasteurization with raw milk, of course. That's the definition. Actually, this leads me to an extra, extra credit. KFF Health News' Tony Lays wrote about the raw milk change in Iowa last year. And he was reporting on how Iowa only just changed their law allowing legal sales of raw milk. And his story, among other things, pointed out that pasteurization helped rein in many serious illnesses in the past, including tuberculosis, typhoid, and scarlet fever. So unfortunately, this is a public health issue that's been going on for a century or more. And we've got a method to deal with this, but not if you're drinking raw milk. So that's my story this <laughs> so week. Now, people are going to drink raw milk and not get childhood vaccines. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> Sorry. Anna, why don't you go next? Um, yeah, mine is from Stat, and it's four top singers lawsuit. It says he visited ER for chest pain and ended up in a straight jacket. It's really scary and maybe not totally surprising, unfortunately, that this is how an older black man was treated when he went to the hospital. But this is Alexander Morris, a member of the Motown group, The Four Tops. These are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, The Four Tops. And he had chest pain and, and problems breathing and went to the hospital in Detroit and was immediately just assumed he was mentally ill. And he ended up quickly in a straight jacket. So he is suing this hospital. And I think, you know, he brought up in this article, he'd seen people talk about like driving while black or walking while black. And he essentially had become sick while black. And he was able to prove he was a famous person. And they took him out of the straitjacket. But 
how many other people haven't had that ability and just been assumed because of the color of their skin to not be having a serious health issue. So I think it's worth a read. Yeah, it was quite a story. Rashna. Um, This week, I will take a, a story from the New York Times that is headlined, Abortion groups say tech companies suppress posts and accounts. It is basically an examination of how TikTok, Instagram, and others sort of how they moderate slash remove content um, about abortion. What's interesting about this is so this is being told from the perspective of individuals who support access to abortion services. And, you know, it, it recounts some examples of, you know, Instagram suspending one group. It was called Mayday Health, which provides information about abortion pill access. There's a uh, telemedicine abortion service called Hey Jane, and where TikTok briefly suspended them. What I thought was really interesting about this is anti-abortion groups have said for longer, actually, that, you know, technology companies have suppressed or censored information about crisis pregnancy centers, for example, that uh, designed to dissuade women from having abortions. And But I think it's sort of like concerns about, broadly speaking, just what the policies are of some of these social media companies and how they decide what information is is acceptable uh, or not. And it sort of details these examples of, again, women who support uh, abortion access or posting TikToks that maybe spell abortion phonetically, like shun is instead of uh, T-I-O-N, it's it's a S-H-U-N, or they'll put a zero instead of an O, and so it doesn't sort of get flagged in the same way. So yeah, definitely a, an, an interesting read. The, the, the fraughtness of social media moderation on this issue and many others. Well, my extra credit this week is from my fellow Michigan fan and sometime podcast guest Jonathan Cohn of HuffPost, and it's called How Americans' Mental Health Crisis Became This Family's Worst Nightmare. And it's basically the story of the entire mental health system in the United States over the last century, as told through the eyes of one middle-class American family about one patient whose trip through the system came to a tragic end. Even if you think you know about this country's failure to adequately treat people with mental illness, even if you do know about this country's failures on mental health, you really do need to read this story. It is that good. All right. That is our show. As always, if you enjoy the podcast, you can subscribe wherever you get your podcast. We'd appreciate it if you left us a review. That helps other people find us too. Special thanks, as always, to our technical guru, Francis Ying, and our doing double duty editor this week, Emery Hudeman. As always, you can email us your comments or questions. We're at whatthehealth, all one word, at kff.org. Or you can still find me at X. I'm at Jay Rovner. Anna? At Anna Edney. Rashana? I'm at Rachana D. Pradhan on X. Emery? I'm lurking on X at Emery DC. <laughs> we will be back in your feed next week. Actually, we'll be coming to you from Aspen next week. But until then, be healthy. Be healthy.